Um, Veronica Tutor uh, is um, she's been involved with the, the peace movement. Um, a veteran, all of her um, adult life, she says. Um, for more than a decade, she's been active in uh, Ayrshire CND, um, which led her to get involved with Scottish CND um, and UK-wide CND, and she's been on the executive and um, the committee for Scottish CND as well. Um, and she's now a paid organiser in the Glasgow office. Um, her, her involvement with the peace movement has led to lots of travel. She's um, walked across Scotland and visited Iceland as a representative of the Scottish peace movement and attended conferences um, in Vienna, uh, Vienna and uh, Oslo. She's also been a parliamentary candidate for the Scottish Green Party three times, um, standing in both Holyrood and Westminster um, elections. And, um, she added that just in case you think she doesn't do anything but politics, she also knits. <laughs> and she probably needs to answer that. So, Veronica, thank you. Okay, I don't have a presentation, so I'm happy to leave it to you. Okay. Um, I went, I wrote down everything I wanted to say, and then I looked for pictures, and there was only one picture. Really, everything I want to say is words. So, Obviously, coming from Scottish CND point of view, I'm going to concentrate on nuclear weapons, but I'm also going to touch on nuclear power. I want to talk about Trident in Scotland, and I want to talk about jobs as a justification for Trident in Europe. But before I begin on any of that, I want to, remember, I want to remind you, because you all know, about the humanitarian effects of nuclear weapons. What we are talking about is indiscriminate weapons that cause genetic damage and environmental damage. The Red Cross have said incalculable human suffering that can be expected to result from any use of nuclear weapons. And they've gone on to highlight the lack of any, any adequate humanitarian response capacity. And because of the statement they made that they couldn't actually, they, they pointed out that you can't get treatment, medical treatment, once there's been a nuclear explosion. Because it affects medical professionals and all, every hospital and clinic as well. So you, there would be obviously some help, but not not enough. That actually ultimately led to the, the discussions for the global ban, which I'll get to at the end of what I'm going to say. But if you, if you just to kind of get this point right in there, because I really want you to remember this when we're talking about jobs as a justification for Trident. And um, when I was in Vienna, which I mentioned earlier, I heard one of the um, A bomb survivors speak, and it was. It, it was really harrowing, and I've just taken one sentence of what she said. I think it's quite difficult to listen to. It's even harder to read. Everybody was covered with blood and burned and blackened and swollen, and skin and flesh was hanging from their bones. Parts of their bodies were missing, and some were carrying their own eyeballs. So when we're talking about jobs and trident, that's what we've got to remember. In case of Trident, what does, what does it actually mean? Well, Trident's designed to have 20 explosions within five minutes, so, not, so it's pretty serious. Um, and the jobs issue is, as I may be labouring this point, secondary to the humanitarian effects. You can't set the moral issue aside and just talk about the jobs. But you also can't set aside that there's a clear link between war and poverty. If you want to make poverty history, you have to make war history too. And also, many people think that nuclear weapons are one thing, and nuclear power is another, and it can be a safe energy source for the future. There are two points I want to remind you of there. There is undeniably a link between nuclear weapons industry and nuclear power, and also nuclear power isn't low carbon or clean. In fact, the nuclear industry affects our climate and environment, from mining to waste disposal, and all points in between, and all those effects are negative. Examples of this Clearly, Fukushima and Chernobyl, very good examples where people have lost, many, many people have lost their homes and their livelihoods and may go on to lose their lives. But closer to home, we've got existing effects in Scotland. I, I have this phrase that I've trot out, nuclear contamination on a beach near you. You're actually a wee bit safer up here than almost out of every other part of Scotland. We've got three nuclear power stations near the shore, all of which have been known to leak. Tritium contamination at Faz Lane. Recite this full of the rusting, rusting hulls of nuclear submarines. At Dundrennan, depleted uranium shells have been fired into the sea and they're still there. And Dalgate Bay obviously be aware of what's going on there. And on top of that, if that's not bad enough around our edges, we've got the transport of nuclear waste by rail and now by air. 
and the transport by rail is every, on a weekly basis right through the centre of Scotland. So, as I said, I want, I'm going to concentrate on nuclear weapons. And the, the cry, the battle cry that we keep hearing, and we hear it from Parliament quite right, and Westminster Parliament quite regularly, is we need it for the jobs. And Jackie famously says, she claims that, uh, sorry, Jackie Bailey, that 11,000 jobs could be at risk if the SNP goes ahead with plans to move nuclear submarines out of Scottish waters. I just want to point out these are not just SNP plans. <laughs> Lots of us are planning it who aren't in the SNP. But apart from the, the 11,000 that she mentions are the wrong figures, it's such a morally bankrupt argument. Jobs at any price. When are we going to say that actually we don't want to cure cancer because oncologists are going to lose their jobs? Same sort of thing. What sort of Scotland do we want? I think that's at the bottom of it. And that's something that's come up as well. What sort of country do you want to live in? I think that came up in the film too. The detail on the Scottish job situation is that there are only 520 civilian jobs related to Trident. And I want to put that in context. A couple of years ago, two, three years ago, I was living in a place called Kilmarnock, which probably nobody's ever heard of. But it's where Johnny Walker whiskey is made, or it was made until then. The Johnny Walker plant was closed, and there was outcry in Kilmarnock, because between seven and 900 jobs were being lost. Now that is more jobs than would be lost with Trident, but most of you won't even have heard about it. This is not relevant if you don't live there. For, more for context, Unison reckon that down to, because of austerity, there have been huge job losses in um, public services, and the figures they give are that by June 2014, 50,000 public service jobs had already been lost in Scotland, and a further 60,000 were due to be lost. So again, putting that in the context of Trident, the job losses are not, or Trident are not huge. Unless, of course, you believe Jackie Bailey's figures. The general job situation for Trident is that Trident replacement sucks jobs away from other areas of the defence sector and obviously from the civilian sector. Trident renewal is not going to bring about new jobs, and any financial benefits that come from it are not going to be local, not going to help local communities. Obviously, the arguments for the nuclear weapons industry are likely to be driven by profit. So can we look to unions for support? There's a spirit of internationalism we expect from unions. And there's a, a spirit of workers are not going to want to be bombing workers in other, or planning to bomb workers in other countries. So you would expect them to be for peace and not for jobs at any price. Unfortunately, that depends on which union you're dealing with. Generally, unions do, are in favour of defence diversification. But obviously, that's easier for trade unions that don't have members in the defence sector. Unite has a kind of odd position. I found two quotes from them. In 2015, they said, defending the jobs and communities of our members in defence is our priority, which sounds a bit dubious to me. But in 2010, they made a much stronger statement. The question of Britain's nuclear weapons system is not about employment alone, however. It is first of all a moral issue, and then a strategic one concerning Britain's place in the world and the international environment we wish to see. The real problem where unions come in are, are the GMB, who are very much behind Trident renewal. Minister, the, their statement says, ministers and MPs need to stop messing about and get on with making the decision to renew. As you know, they did make the decision to renew. Meanwhile, this STUC, the Scottish Trade Unions Congress, and its Scottish CMD are calling for a Scottish Defence Diversification Agency. So this is to plan for the conversion of military facilities to civilian use. And their main focus would be planning and resourcing the diversification of jobs away from defence projects such as Trident and promoting the greening of the Scottish economy. And while we're on that, it seems a good time to mention independence. And I don't just mean Scottish independence, but I'll do that first. In Scotland, we are the unwilling hosts of Trident. And most of us don't want them, and our Scottish Parliament doesn't want them. We just, but we don't just want to get them out of Scotland, we want to get them out of the UK and out of the world. If we do get independence the next time round, that's going to go a long way towards that because there is nowhere where the, where the, um, the base could be safely moved in um, England. 
And then the other part about independence is, is it an independent nuclear deterrent? Well, it's not. We're really closely linked to America, and at the moment that's quite worrying because there's somebody in charge in America we can't really be sure what he's going to do. Trump has made conflicting statements about nuclear weapons. It, they're not helped when you're trying to understand them, and I've looked at all this stuff. He does because he doesn't express himself clearly, so he, you really can't tell where it's going. And as a result, there is actually a clear pro-Trump camp in the peace camp, the peace movement, which I'm not part of. But some people do believe that he is going to be a good thing for get for disarmament. I don't agree, <laughs> but you're free to agree. <laughs> the, the irony is though that the end of the end of nuclear weapons will be beginning in New York, and it will be beginning next week. Because last year there was a vote at the UN, and where they voted over the United Nations, a, a number of governments, a large number, voted overwhelmingly in favour of a resolution to start negotiations on a new treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons. And the treaty won't, won't just prohibit nuclear weapons, but it would make using, processing, and developing nuclear weapons illegal under international law. The negotiations start on Monday. One of my colleagues has already flown out to join in. And they finish in July. There's another session. There's a session now and there's a session in June and July. So by the middle of July, we should have a, a treaty, a global treaty, banning nuclear weapons. That's not going to put me out of a job the next day. It, it, but it's, a, it's totally a step in the right direction to changing the atmosphere and changing how it's kind of like you can think about how when, when I was young it was okay to drink and drive and now it's considered completely you know, beyond the pale and it's the same with smoking. You change, you change the narrative and people catch up with that. Okay, I'm nearly done. <laughs> so um, hopefully we're going to be looking at trying renewal cancellation shortly. And at last, there's going to be an end to the discussion about why we need to make deadly indiscriminate weapons as a job creation scheme in Scotland. <laughs>